assistant professor of the Depart department of mass communication to have the welcome address. Good morning, everyone, distinguished guests and dear participants. It is a proud moment for the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism, Parishiraja College, Pulpalli, to host such a wonderful webinar series entitled Hablemos 21. On this occasion, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this inaugural function. I hope you will enjoy this session. Now, let me come to my duty. First of all, I heartily welcome His Excellency, Dr. Joseph Mar Thomas, patron and manager of this college to this function. His Excellency is a renowned economist and educationist. I extend a warm welcome to you. Next, I welcome our principal, Dr. Anil Kumar K to this function. His endless support and encouragement is a driving force to us. Welcome, sir. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Jensen Moore, Assistant Professor, Gaylord College of Journalism and Mass Communication, University of Oklahoma, United States, who is leading the opening session of this webinar series. We are happy to have such a wonderful personality with us. I hope her words will give insight into the field of communication. I cordially welcome Dr. Deborah Raj, Assistant Professor, Department of Communication, Madras Christian College, Chennai, who is moderating the first session. A very warm welcome to you, ma'am. With pleasure, I welcome Dr. Dilip MR, Vice Principal and IQAC Coordinator of Parishiraja College. We are very happy to you have to be in this function. Thank you. I welcome Father Vargis Kallamaudi, CEO of our college, and Father Lasar Putangandatil Barsaran, Managing Council Director, Parishiraja College, Pilpale. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Jobin Joy, Head of the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism, who is the master brain behind this webinar series. I also welcome all other heads, faculty members, and students of various departments. Now, I cordially welcome all participants, including faculty members, research scholars, and students from inside and outside the country to this function. I wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you. I would like to call upon <laughs> Job Enjoy, Head of Mass Communications, the webinar convener. have Dr. Robert Gucci from Lancaster Uni University in the UK. He will be speaking on podcasting toward reckoning, developing a tool for a journalistic reflexivity. On the 20th, we have Basant Ayada from the City University College, 
of Ajman UAE and she will be handling a session on shifting advertising strategies. We have our moderators from moderators, Dr. Vaprada and Deborah Raj from Madras Christian College, Janin Raj from St. Paul's College, Bangalore, and Shobin Matthew from Parishiraja College, Vainad. As of now, we have over 200 registrants from various countries like Serbia, Sri Lanka, Bahrain, Somalia, Ghana, Pakistan, and Canada. Our resource persons are from US, UK, United Arab Emirates, and from India. Thus, Hablamos 21 becomes a platform where people from 10 countries across the globe sit together and discuss various concerns of mass communication. At this juncture, the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism, Parasi Raja College, thanks its management, especially our patron, His Excellency, Dr. Joseph Mar Thomas, and our respected principal, Dr. K. Anil Kumar, for extending all possible supports and encouragement to organize this international event in our college. I also thank our entire college management, particularly Father Vergis and Father Lasse, for constantly encouraging and making yourself available when and where required. I recollect the encouragement and suggestions from our Vice Principal, Dr. M.R. Dilip, and Director of Self Finance Stream, Ms. Tara Philip, and all heads of departments and other office bearers from Parasi Raja College. I have my team of faculty members around the clock with absolute support for this event, in particular, Mr. Shobin, Mr. Jibin, Mr. Litin, and Ms. Christina. I also recognize the support of Mr. K.P. Harishankar, the student secretary of the MassCom Association. A special mention to Mr. Litin Matthew, my faculty member for christening the webinar series with Habla Most 21, the most suitable name for this international mass communication discussion platform. This is a humble beginning, and I thank each and every resource person who has agreed to join Hablamos 21. We have planned our sessions as per Indian standard time, but our resource persons are joining as per their time zones, which are completely different from ours. For example, today's speaker, Dr. Jensen Moore, is joining from USA by 10.30 p.m. on the 16th of November, almost 12 hours behind. For, for her, it will be midnight once we conclude today's session. This is just an example. As you know, other resource persons are also struggling to cope up with our time, time zone constraints, but have agreed to make them available to enrich and encourage us. Now, the space is ready for the discussion. Hablamos, let's talk. Now we could have the presidential address by our principal, Dr. Anil Kumar K. A very good day. The most respected manager and patron of Parishraja College, His Excellency, Dr. Joseph Mar Thomas. The speaker of today's session, Dr. The first session, Dr. Jensen Moore. The moderator of this today's session, Dr. Deborah Raj, Assistant Professor, Madras Christian College. The head of the Department of Mass Communication of our college, Dr. Jobin Joy. The CEO of Parishraja College, uh, Father Vargis Kalamaudi. Our Bursar and Managing Council Director, Father Lasser Putangandatil, heads of department from various uh, de uh, heads of various departments, faculty members, students, and uh, participants from different parts of the world. At the outset, I congratulate the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism of this college for organizing this wonderful international webinar series, a four-day international webinar series. And uh, as you all know, we, the Parasiraja College, is moving to our second cycle of NAC accreditation. 
the purpose of accreditation as you know is quality enhancement quality improvement quality in all respects in our academics as well as in other aspects and uh, we are conducting number of programs right from the last so many years we have been organizing seminars uh, uh, webinars and all activities to share the thoughts of different uh, experts from different parts of the world earlier also we conducted years back we conducted international seminars by the department of uh, tourism and uh, after that we conducted uh, different uh, national uh, seminars now with the outbreak of the pandemic we are not in a position to conduct uh, uh, in the webinars and uh, mean and uh, conferences in the offline mode and hence we moved to online mode and so many programs we have conducted uh, for the last so many, uh, two years and uh, uh, as you know that the academic conferences are actually is inevitable or integral part of any scientific community by attending an international conference uh, we are able to create what is called a network with the people in different parts people means academicians and experts in industry experts from industry in different parts are joining together so that we can interact with them and uh, we will come to know about the, the recent uh, findings of their researches therefore it is integral as far as an academic institution is concerned all such conferences indeed enable us to increase our knowledge and also it increases the reputation of our institution and in that sense this seminar is very important say so another aspect of this kind of exercises is we keep updated with the new findings which have taken place in different parts of the world in addition to that we the students the researchers all getting inputs for researchers by attending a conference you will be getting sparks for conducting researches and also to write a paper or uh, write different papers on different areas or new developments in that way i am sure that all the students all the pa uh, uh, the participants dignitary uh, studies from different parts of the world will be making use of this program a wonderful one and in our college uh, with the able guidance of our patron dr joseph mar thomas he is not only a manager he is a spiritual leader as well as an academician in that way he is giving us all sorts of guidance and support for conducting all the academic exercises in the college for the last uh, few months the our able management has supported us in different ways in moral support as well as in the financial support they have provided a lot of facilities for the enhancement of academic activities in this college i am taking this opportunity to thank the management for uh, helping us uh, for guiding us and leading us Uh, to uh, uh, to conduct various activities and we are expecting a good grade in the coming accreditation process and uh, uh, with these few words i once again uh, congratulate the department for organizing this wonderful program and also i am hope that a lot of deliberations will take place in this uh, webinar thank you now i would invite his excellency dr joseph mar thomas manager and patron to inaugurate this session esteemed principal of the college dr anil kumar distinguished guests of the day Dr. Jensen Mar from United States of America, Dr. Ribara Raj from Madras Christian College, Chennai, uh, 
vice principal of the college now we are ceo of the college pravesh prangkuli managing council director and director of the college rasa putram mandalathil dr jobin choy the head of the department of past communication and journalism professor tara philip the coordinator of the unaided section of the college faculty members of the college students other distinguished guests participants from friends from different parts of the country and the world they are not members of the assembly it is indeed a gratifying recollection for me to understand that the department of mass communication journalism of persiraja college is conducting a webinar on a pertinent subject communication in times of crisis at the outset i congratulate the principal all the faculty members vice principal hod dr vijay department of journalism mass communication and all others who have designed this beautiful webinar marar i can me my blessings and best wishes for the program mass communication is a process of create sending receiving and analyzing messages to large audiences to verbal or written media these mediums are wide ranging and include print digital media social media internet radio television different technology and so on communication is identified as one of the most important skill required for the 21st century today communication is acting as the tool for socio economic and cultural changes in the society it has got an unavoidable role in the reformist activities of the world and uh, socio political advancement in the society we are living in a digital world today media and media related courses are obtained prominent job in the prominent role in the global job market Hence, the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism is greater responsibility in imparting good programs to the formation of the students and the development of the society at large. Affective communication gives the meaning of the message. sharing of the message and bringing people closer knowledge is the most important key component of the communication it is generally said that there are five levels of communication namely phonological information the sound of language meaning of the word and its combination conception understanding system of belief and finding finally er explanation reinforcement and uh, summarization we can improve our communication by improving the language and pronunciation box of voice modulation body language enhanced reading 
interpersonal and intrapersonal interactions, practice modulations, proactive meditation, and finally by keeping good confidence. I think this webinar will unveil the most important features of modern communication and the related items. Once more, I congratulate the principal, vice principal, faculty members, and members of the management council for arranging a very meaningful seminar. Persiraja College has come forward within a short period of time. The Academy Society of Kerala by conducting these types of international seminar. So it is my great pleasure to congratulate the Department of Mass Communication and all those associated with this beautiful webinar. With this short reflection, I am very happy to announce that this webinar is inaugurated. May God bless you. Thank you. And now I call upon our Vice Principal, Dr. Dilip Emma, for the felicitation. His Excellency, Most Reverend Dr. Joseph Mar Thomas, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, I think uh, we should not take much of the time because the floor is basically for the deliberations by the experts. Certainly, it's a very proud moment for the college because you know they have arranged a galaxy of speakers, experts from across the world. Certainly, it should be modeled for the the rest of the departments as well, that they to have to come up with this kind of activities that should bring a lot of uh, fame and score for discussions. We have uh, you know experts from different parts of the world, even from USA. That's really something we should be you know very happy about. I would like to congratulate the Department of Mass Communication because they have been always innovative. They come up with wonderful opportunities wonderful programs, and also the hard work of the people, those who are involved in this program, including the faculty and the student representatives and the other students of the department. They've been working very hard. They've been very innovative, and uh, it should be appreciated. So on behalf of the college, uh, I should uh, first of all thank uh, the department and congratulate and wish the very best for the program. You know that uh, uh, the floor, uh, I mean, everything is ready for the, uh, even the coordinators already hinted that uh, there is not enough time for further discussion. We have to go for the, you know, presentations by the respected uh, experts. Congratulations to departments again. All the best. Thank you very much. Uh, we have our chief executive officer, Reverend Father Wagis, for the felicitation. His Excellency, Dr. Joseph Mar Thomas, manager and patron of the college, our principal, respected dignitaries from different places from the globe, dear participants, my dear friends. You know, I'm a little bit excited by participating in such an international webinar organized by the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism of our college. I would say that the department is very vibrant and also very prompt in conducting a variety of programs on these days. I congratulate the department, both the faculties and the students for their wonderful initiatives 
and I wish a big success for the Habilamos, the international webinar. Thank you. In the last session of our inauguration, word of thanks by Ms. Christina Joseph, Assistant Professor, Department of Mass Communication. Good morning and greetings of the day. His Excellency, Dr. Joseph Mar Thomas, Manager and Patron, Dr. Anil Kumar K, Principal, our resource person, Dr. Jensen Moore, moderator, Dr. Deborah Jraj, faculty members, participants, and my dear students. It is such an honor for me to get the opportunity to thank you all on behalf of the Department of Mass Communication and Journalism, Parshiraja College, Pulpalli. I would like to express my gratitude to all esteemed delegates of the inaugural session for your kind presence and support. I extend my gratitude to His Excellency, Dr. Joseph Mar Thomas, manager at Patron P.S. Parashiraja College for finding time from his busy schedule to grace the occasion and inaugurate Hablamos 21. Thank you for inspiring and encouraging us with your words on this special occasion. A special thanks to Dr. K. Anil Kumar, Principal Parashiraja College for providing imm immense support to organize this webinar. I also wish to express my gratitude to the speaker of Hablamos 21, Dr. Jensen Moore, Assistant Professor, Oklahoma University, United States for the coming session. I may like to express our sincere thanks to moderator of this event, Dr. Deborah Raj, Assistant Professor, Department of Communication, Madras Christian College, Chennai. I extend my gratitude to Dr. Dilip MR, Vice Principal and IQAC Coordinator of coordinator for his support. I extend my special thanks to Father Vargis Kalamaudi, CEO, and Father Lasal Putankandat Tilbasar, Professor Tara Phillips, Self-Finance Director, Parshiraja College, they are for their presence. I also thank Dr. Jobin Choi, webinar coordinator, and other faculty members from the Department of Mass Communication for all your efforts. I'm running short of words to express my humble thanks to all participants, including department heads and faculty members, research scholars, students from inside and outside the country, and entire core co team members and Moscow Association for going to make this event as a grand success. Once again, I thank one and all present here. With the note, I conclude my words. Now let's move to the opening session of Hablamos 21. I request our host to guide us further. Thank you and have a great session. And our session is open for Hablamos 21. Let's talk. And now I hand over the session to our moderator, Dr. Deborah Raj, Assistant Professor, Department of Communication, Madras Christian College, Chennai. Yeah, hope I'm audible. Yes, you are, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. I'll proceed. A very good day to everyone present today. Hablamos 2021. I think has done justice to the topic. And I take this opportunity to thank the management of Parasi Raja College for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be the moderator today. I also extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Jobin Joy, without whom this would not have been possible at all. The topic today cannot be more right in times as these. The topic that is communicating in the times of crisis. And the person is more apt for the topic, Dr. Jensen Moore. Without much ado, I would like to introduce you today to our expert. I'm, I deem it a pleasure to introduce Dr. Jensen Moore, PhD, who is an assistant professor at the Gaylord College of Mass Communication at the University of Oklahoma. She teaches public relations, crisis communication, and social media strategies. 
Her primary research interests are at the intersection of social media, crisis communication, and health communication. Specifically, she examines how individuals and organizations use social media for mourning, information sharing, and information seeking following man-made and natural disasters. Moore's primary research interests are at the intersection of social media, health communication, and crisis communication. Additionally, her scholarly work examines online learning in journalism and mass communication. To date, Moore has published more than 20 journal articles, book chapters, and refereed proceedings, and presented more than 40 papers at research proceed conferences. Moore received her doctorate in journalism from the Missouri School of Journalism and her master's degree in journalism and mass communication from the University of Minnesota. Moore earned three bachelor's degree from Black Hill State University in South Dakota. Business administration, marketing, and mass communication with dual emphasis in journalism and public relations. She has also received a minor in psychology. I think we, uh, uh, with very timings, uh, Mo has accepted to be, uh, you know, the subject matter expert today. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Moore. And a, a minimal instruction to the audience uh, who are online and offline as well. Kindly keep uh, your mic muted at all times. Uh, when the speaker likes to interact with the audience, you may raise your hand and the moderator may allow you to speak. There will be a question and answer session at the end um, of this particular session. You may interact with the expert by raising your hands again. You may also interact using the chat option during the question and answer session. So thank you all for joining. And without much ado, I invite Ms. Jensen Moore, Dr. Jensen Moore, the stage is all yours now. Let me get this started quickly. Good morning to you all. Um, it's actually evening where I'm at. So I just put my kids to bed and uh, am, am joining you. It's about 11.30 p.m. where I'm at. So you guys are already into Wednesday. Um, I would like to thank you for having me today. I'm very honored to be speaking to all of you. And I thank you for, to uh, Dr. Jovan Joy for inviting me to speak at this session. Um, obviously, we have all been living in a crisis for the last two years. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that have been happening during COVID that we've seen. Um, and I'm going to bring, bring forth some examples of different crises as we talk about things. I'm going to kick off uh, by talking about the phases of a crisis. And so it's important that we understand that crises are, are not linear. They don't move in one direction at all times. Um, and they don't necessarily go through the same phases while they're occurring for um, other industries or even within the same type of crisis. But what we do see is that we can, we can very clearly see that before a crisis, we should be focusing on detection. Uh, we should be preparing things behind the scenes for the event of a crisis. Um, during the crisis, we should be looking at more ways to possibly head off uh, the crisis uh, turning larger than what we would avoid like to see. Um, following the crisis, we look at recovery and we start to figure out ways to change the image of our organization back to what it was pre-crisis or improve the image of our organization. And then finally, our last stage is when we actually learn from what it was we did during the crisis so that we can go back and look at our plans so that we can take stock in what did and did not work. And so we can try to figure out if we have to do this all over again, 
what are the lessons that we take forward from this and how can we make sure that we we go through a crisis appropriately the next time one happens. So I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about each of these phases and what they entail. Um, that first phase is detection. And this is a very important phase that all organizations should be involved in. Um, I used to live in Louisiana along what was called chemical corridor. And it was just a series of different chemical and electronic plants that were lined up along the Mississippi. The, the access from those plants to the Mississippi River was immediate, where they could put their products right onto the barges and take them down the river to the Gulf and be able to ship them out. Well, these various chemical plants had crises happening all the time. And some of my students and I were talking to them one semester about, well, you know, what's, what is the crisis plan that you have in place? What are you monitoring for? What is it that you're trying to evaluate? And we were surprised at how many of the plants had no crisis plan of their own and were not doing any kinds of detection. So literally they would have a competitor next door they would have some kind of a big chemical spill and they weren't doing anything to make sure that they had something in place in case they had a chemical spill. And so detection is that first step. And so we look at two different ways that you can be kind of proactive in detecting. And the first is issues management. And this is looking to see what are things that can move from an issue to a crisis. So you're constantly scanning. This is where your environmental scanning takes place. Uh, you're looking at what's happening within your same industry to some of your competitors. Um, and you're looking to see what are some things outside of your industry that that could become something that could be an issue for you as well. The other thing that we like to do is what we call risk management. Um, and this is taking stock of some of those uncertain events and trying to figure out how you can control for them or at least minimize the impact that they could have on your organization. And a lot of times in risk management, we're looking at the same things that we would if we were to develop a SWOT for our organization. We would be looking at those external threats. So we would be looking at things that are political, things that are economic, things that are social, and things that are technological. So we use that PEST model to try to understand what those things are that could influence us that, again, can turn from an issue, an everyday kind of happening, to an actual crisis. And so we want to make sure that we're being very proactive and we're looking at those things. And we have to tell our organizations as public relations people, we have to make sure that they understand that it's not an if situation, that it's not if a crisis hits you, it's really when and what type of crisis is likely to hit you. Our next stage that we look at is prevention and preparation. So it's not enough to just scan the environment and figure out what issues might turn into crises you should also be working with your organization to put various things in place for when a crisis occurs. The first thing that you should be doing is building your brand and figuring out what your organization stands for. And when we counsel public relations, people often go in and say, well, we need to look at your mission statement and what is it your organization does? And we need to look at your vision statement. What is it you want to be known for? Um, we're also talking to them about their kind of CSR statement, their diversity statements. What are the things that you are doing, your organization is doing socially to make an impact in the community that you operate in? And so one of the things that we talk about before a crisis hits is to have a very strong corporate social responsibility program that your organization is, is running. Those CSR efforts are often ways that your organization can come out the other end of a crisis, um, at least in a good position with your publics. Um, in the US a few years ago, um, one of our number one baby brands uh, it's Graco. They had a situation where their baby strollers had a defect 
And when parents were collapsing the baby strollers from, you know, holding the infant and holding the, the car seat, uh, they would take the, the stroller and collapse it down. You may have seen this at an airport when people kind of take the stroller and fold it flat so that it can be moved or shipped. Um, when they were collapsing the baby strollers, um, the little baby fingertips were getting caught in the mechanism and a couple babies were, were sent to emergency rooms with their fingertips actually severed off by the baby strollers. Um, obviously this is a huge issue and it got back to Graco and they immediately stepped in and recalled all of their baby strollers, began giving a new product to customers and offering apologies, offering to pay the, the hospital bills of the babies who had been affected. Um, but that crisis should have been something that devastated their reputation. What Graco, however, had been doing for years before this baby stroller incident was actually doing CSR efforts in various communities with new moms. They've been doing mommy and me playtimes. They've been doing mommy blogs. They've been doing mommy meetups. Um, They've been doing all of this stuff for moms so that when this crisis hit, the group that was the most vocal in supporting them were moms. And so they came out on the other side of the crisis in a great position because they had done those CSR efforts before the crisis hit. So those type of efforts, those community results, those kind of things where you're focusing on the people who are most important to your organization are often ways that your organization can come out the other side of a crisis in a good position. So that brand, building your brand and having CSR efforts be part of your brand is very important. The next thing that we do pre-crisis is actually put together your crisis management team. Know who is going to be answering questions during times of crisis and know who they're going to be talking to. And so one of the things that we look at in crisis communication are what we call command centers or information center is going to be located is important. It needs to have some kind of space where everybody's going to organize. Um, even if that space is virtual, which is a lot of what we've seen during COVID is that those command centers are virtual locations where everyone can get together and share information. But understanding who are gonna be the spokespeople, who are gonna be the people talking to say the media, who are going to be people who are going to be talking to employees and families that are affected, who are going to be people who are out talking to your elected officials, um, who are going to be people who are talking to your suppliers, so other people that you do business with. That is actually one of the, the places that kind of gets left out of a lot of crisis communication plans because we, we get very wrapped up in talking to our customers and talking to the people who would regulate our organization and talking to the media that we forget that the people who work with us and often have a really big part in our organization's success, those suppliers, they need to hear from us as well. And we have to be telling them what's happening and what it is that our organization is doing at all times. So putting that command center and understanding who all of those various people are going to be and making sure that they all know who's gonna be talking and what they're, who they're gonna be talking to, that's important to do before a crisis hits. You don't really have time to assemble all of that and sort that out when you're in a crisis. So those things have to be put in place beforehand. You also have to make sure that you are understanding what information you're going to hand out to people. Um, in the US, we're seeing a crisis of misinformation. We're seeing a lot of very non-factual information being fed out on social media sites. And so we have to make sure that anybody who is going to be talking to the media, talking to our customers, talking to employees and their families is saying things that are truthful and accurate and are being conveyed in a way that makes sense, that has context uh, associated with it. And so one of the things that we talk about in the US 
is that it's important to arm the people who are answering the phones. And in India, I know you guys know how important this is because you guys are that first line of defense for a lot of misinformation. And so if I have a CEO who is going and speaking out about something, well, our CEOs aren't the ones answering the phones on an everyday basis. So if we have a crisis happening, the people who are answering the phones are the ones we have to have that frontline information so they know what is and isn't acceptable to say to someone who calls and who they should be directing people to, and what the company line is, what it is that the company wants them to say during that crisis. And so we have to make sure we're looping in anybody who is going to be interacting with our publics down to the people who are gonna be answering the phones and making sure that they know what's going on as well. That's the only way that we can make sure that our information gets out is to make sure everybody is going to have access to it and is able to share it. crisis plan. And so not only having that command center that where we've got all the people who are going to be speaking, but we have an actual strategy in place with how to deal with what's going to happen. The first part of that plan is determining what are our objectives at the end of this crisis? Is our objective to make sure that our publics feel safe and secure? Is our objective to make sure that our reputation is back to where it was before or is in a better position? Is our objective to make sure that anyone who is harmed has been taken care of and that we can do things where we've shown that we're gonna make changes going forward? So first part of the plan is determining in a perfect world, what would people think about us or say about us after the crisis? Next thing we wanna do is think about when a crisis hits, who do we need to communicate with? We are going to have some very distinct target audiences that we need to make sure that we have communications designed for. And so thinking about the audience is always our first step in messaging. So we have to understand who those audiences are before we start talking to them during, during the crisis phase. Next, we want to come up with a couple statements that we have prepared for those crises that we, during our detection phase, we probably identified that there are standard crises that hit our industry. So for example, if I'm in the oil and gas industry, I know that an oil spill has got to be something that I am prepared for. I know that this is a very dangerous job and sometimes accidents happen and we lose workers on the job. So I know that that is a crisis that I have to be prepared for. So if I know that those are things that happen in my industry, I should already have some stock messaging kind of prepared for when that happens that I can be, that I can easily tweak to send out to our various publics. The next thing I need to know is what channels do I use? Once I know who those target audiences are, I need to figure out what channels they're on because if I'm putting out my messages on a channel that they're not using, then they're not going to receive those messages and they're not going to know what's happening during the crisis. Um, so, for example, I was talking to high schoolers yesterday about coming up with social media plans and we're, we were talking about whether they should have things on Facebook. And, they were, and one of the things that they very acutely pointed out was that a lot of people of their generation are not on Facebook, are not on some of these social media sites. Their generation is on sites like Twitter or like Twitter to, to complain mainly, but on TikTok and Snapchat. So things where it's a quick message, it's, you know, accompanied by a video, um, but they're not on something like Facebook. So that doesn't make sense for us to try to target them. So knowing your target audience and knowing which channels that they're on is an important part of your plan as well. And again, this all needs to get put into place before you have a crisis, because it's not possible to come up with a plan on the fly and figure out how this is going to take place while you're in the middle of a crisis. So the next thing that you, you want to do is do media training with anybody who is going to be talking to reporters. And again, 
this has to be part of your crisis preparation. You have to determine who those spokespeople for your organization are going to be, and you have to make sure that they know how they look on camera. Do they have weird quirks or tics? Um, do they, like I do, do they overuse their hands when they're talking? You have to keep them kind of centrally located. Um, do they have stuttering problems or do they say the word like or um all the time? And so doing that media training, getting them on the camera, doing some mock uh, communications, some mock press conferences, some mock interviews with them so they can take questions and learn how to field questions. And then having them watch themselves back on that, on that recorded uh, video, that's often very helpful for people to understand what they need to change and how they need to adapt to a crisis situation. Um, making sure that the people that we're gonna put in front of the camera are competent. And so knowing that people make mistakes in crisis situations, and we wanna be able to kind of prepare them for those mistakes so that they feel comfortable, they don't lose their composure, um, and they don't kind of fall for leading questions or questions that can open them up to, you know, taking, taking full responsibility for something that their legal department is going to say, hey, no, we can't take responsibility for that. That opens us off to, up, opens us up to lawsuits. Um, and so understanding what some of those questions are and how to answer those questions as part of their media training. Um, there are some of what we call our B attitudes for interview success. So when we're when we're doing that media training, we want to tell people to be accurate, be honest, be brief. Um, we talk about the five W's. So who, what, when, where, why, and obviously our H is how. So think about answering those five W's every time that you make a statement. Um, we want it to be interesting. We want it to be clear. Obviously, in public relations, we want openness, honesty, transparency. Um, we want them to be enthusiastic. So it, it doesn't help anybody if you're in a crisis situation and you act like Tiger Woods. Um, I, how many of you guys saw Tiger Woods' apology video a few years ago when he got in a, a lot of trouble for his extramarital affairs? He was drinking. He, you know, got into a car accident. He was in a fight with his wife. And his apology, if you watch that video, it, it was very monotone, very You could kind of. Excuse me, ma'am, you are on mute. Excuse me, ma'am, you have muted. I hope it's fixed. All right, am I back? Yes, Can you all hear me? You're already been, you're already been. Okay. Um, so I was talking a little bit about Tiger Woods and how he didn't look very enthusiastic in his apology video. And so making sure that you're showing that you care about the crisis is very important as well. Um, being positive in your communications is very important. Um, and so making sure that what is taking place is you making the, the organization look as, again, open, honest, transparent, but talking about the things that your organization is doing to remove the crisis is an important attitude to have. Um, being confident in the messaging that you're putting out, and finally being credible. So not putting out any false information, 
not using the words no comment because no comment often makes it look like your organization is hiding something or is guilty of something. Um, and so part of being credible is saying, I don't know in some instances when a reporter asks you a question saying, I don't know the answer to that, but I will get back to you instead of the words no comment. And then making sure you get back to those people with the answer is part of your credibility as well. Um, we tend to think in sound bites. And so I often tell people to create talking points. Um, and so having those messages prepared beforehand is very important. Um, the media here in the US are television stations when they come out to film and they actually present things on their broadcast. Um, they don't give a lot of airtime to crises. When they put things together in their package for the night, their, their, their entire coverage of that crisis might be about two to three minutes. And that's a lot. That takes up a really large chunk of what goes into the news that night. And so when we're talking to people and we're training them to be on camera, we have this formula that we tell them, and it's 27 words, nine seconds, three key points. And so this is because when people are interviewing you, they're going to take about five to 10 seconds of what you said and fit it into their broadcast because they're gonna provide context, they're gonna provide a lot of the background and facts of the situation. And they're only gonna they're only gonna take a snippet of what you said on camera. And so if we do that formula, that 27 words, nine seconds, three key points, that means that you can get a lot of your message out in those nine seconds. And that makes sure that the, the people interviewing you will use that clip in their broadcast because it won't involve you rambling and rambling and rambling and saying something that they can't use later on, that they have to cut and that cut doesn't make sense. Um, so thinking about what those questions are ahead of time and preparing those very short talking points according to this template. The next thing that we, we often talk about is preparing fact sheets about your organization that you can disseminate quickly to the media. Um, these can be things about where you were founded, your history, what your mission is, what your values are, um, but things that they can use when they're developing stories about you. And obviously, if there are things that you can put in there, facts about the crisis that's taking place, then that is important as well. But those proof points help when you're making those points to the media and help kind of support whatever that is, that narrative is that you're talking about. All right, our next stage after pre preparation is containment. So this is assuming that you are in the crisis situation, your organization that a crisis has occurred and your organization is now in the process of managing the crisis. Um, and we call it containment because we really do wanna make sure that we've looked at this crisis from all angles and we've got a firm hold on the crisis as we're moving forward. And our first step in kind of understanding that is identifying the type of crisis that our organization is in. And so you'll see from this list, those crises fit into kind of two main categories. They're either violent, which means there is some kind of a physical um, altercation or a death, or they're nonviolent, which means that there aren't casualties of any kind. And so kind of going from there, we kind of break these down further into disasters, accidents, uh, people who are opposing us. So this could be competitors, this could be special interest groups, this could be lobbyists, this could be um, grassroots organizations whose only, only uh, objective is to oppose what it is your organization does. This could be crime that occurs, um, in our other nonviolent categories, this can be that the business was mismanaged in some way, or that the, the people who worked at this business had some kind of ethical or moral failing. But knowing what type of crisis you're in is a very important first step. Um, the next step 
And this is a this is one that I when I'm doing my research that I personally use a lot is figuring out what your primary interest in this this crisis situation is. And I particularly like uh, situational crisis communication theory, which was developed by Timothy Coombs, um, because Coombs said that the main thing that you should do is protect your stakeholders. And I really like that because it kind of plays into this idea that organizations should be doing good, that it's not just about the bottom line. It's not just about how much money your organization makes or how many you know, facilities you have globally or how many people you employ. It's about doing good. And so Coombe says that it's not necessarily about reputation. And so you'll see that there are lots of other crisis communication theories out there that talk about the reputation of the organization. He says that you should actually look to protect the individuals, which in a lot of cases are the people that are most harmed by the crisis. So sometimes this is gonna be your employees, if, if this is employees who are being hurt, it can be your customers who are being hurt. It can be a more general public that is being hurt. Um, but understanding who is being harmed and how that Coombe says that once we know what kind of crisis we have, we should use one of three strategies. And so Coombs is one of those people who is very into applied theories, which means not only am I going to put forth a theory, I'm going to talk about how we actually apply it in practice. And so he says, in practice, if we have no crisis or we really don't have responsibility for a crisis, then we can use what's called a denial strategy. If we have a crisis where we're not necessarily at fault, yes, our organization is in crisis, but we were not necessarily the cause of it then we can use what's called a diminish strategy. If we're in a crisis and we are very clearly at fault, then we need to look at what he calls rebuilding strategies, because this is where we have some work to do with our stakeholders. They have been harmed and we are the ones to blame for it. And so we need to rebuild our relationship with this public. And so this is where we have to do that work to protect the stakeholders and we have to do that rebuilding. And so I'm gonna break this down a little further uh, because he does talk about those clusters that I just mentioned. So when we're in an accidental cluster of the type of crisis, which the nonviolent disaster, violent disaster, nonviolent accident and violent accident fall into our accidental cluster. Uh, now these can be man-made or natural. So when I talk about man-made, this is where we get into bombings, shootings, et cetera. If we're talking about natural disasters, I'm talking about floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, those kind of things. In each case, our organization can be severely affected by man-made or natural disasters and we're not at fault, right? These things happen and we could not do anything to prevent them or control them. But our organization is in the middle of this. And so we have to figure out what it is that we can do. A lot of organizations right now are dealing with COVID. COVID is not their fault, but they're facing different crises because of this natural, it's essentially a natural disaster that has hit us globally. And so we have to figure out those diminished strategies. And so I'm going to show you guys a couple of diminished strategies that are used commonly, and that they include diversionary responses, deliberate inaction on the part of the organization, and what we call, all right, so for our diversionary responses, um, we look at four main categories, concession, where the organization gives something to the public, um, ingratiation, where the organization tries to charm the public by talking about the good things that they've done in the past, or talking about different parts of the organization that are doing well compared to the, or the part of the organization that is in crisis, um, using dis 
association or trying to and relabeling. And this is very common. Uh, public relations people like to look at word choices and figure out how do we change this so that maybe it doesn't look like as much of a crisis. Um, and so relabeling is one of the things that we look at. Um, the one that actually happens the most um, is concession. So we talk about sponsors. Um, and many of you probably saw what happened to the U.S. several years ago with uh, the Deepwater Horizon accident. Uh, this is where BP had an explosion on one of its oil rigs off the coast um, of Louisiana and Alabama um, and Mississippi. And hundreds of thousands of, of, of um, ounces of crude oil flowed into the Gulf following this explosion. Um, and BP did a lot of things in the, in the area as far as sponsorships, as far as uh, different community events that they were taking part in to kind of give back to the people who lived in those areas. The other thing that they did on a very large scale was become one of the sponsors of the Olympics that year. And so anytime that someone in the US was tuning into one of the Olympic sports, we would see some kind of a sponsorship ad from BP. And so they were very clearly trying to make sure that the public knew what it is that they were doing to clean up the oil spill and to put things right in that, in that area of the country that was hit. Um, and so that was one of the tactics that they used. Uh, the other thing that we see a lot of is disassociation. Um, and BP did this as well uh, during the oil spill. They, they talked about how it was the fault of some of their suppliers, that the suppliers had given them pieces for the oil rigs that were prone to disaster. Um, and so they kind of tried to, to hoist the blame onto someone else. And that didn't work for them because the media and the public very clearly was saying, no, this is your fault. This is your oil rig. This is something that you cannot dissociate yourself from. And so that response did not work well for them. Now, on the other hand, um, Ford, who years back had an issue with their tires, Firestone tires on uh, the Ford Explorer were blowing up and causing uh, accidents to happen. And so Ford came out with a statement talking about how this was not their crisis. This was not their responsibility. These tires were created by a vendor of theirs, Firestone. And so these accidents were actually the responsibility of Firestone. And so by talking about who had created this part that went on their product, it kind of changed the direction of the media and what the media was talking about. And so the media instead of going after Ford and talking about how dangerous the Ford Explorer was, started instead talking about Firestone and Firestone tires. And so it became a much bigger crisis for Firestone um, and people stopped talking about Ford as, as the kind of main cause of the crisis. Uh, now, the next response that we see in this accident cluster is deliberate inaction. And so in some cases, uh, people will not talk and see if the crisis will kind of blow over. Um, now, this works if you have a small crisis. This does not work if you have a large crisis like people dying. You can't just not talk and expect the crisis to go away. Um, and so the, the things that we look at with deliberate act inaction are strategic silence, strategic ambiguity, and strategic inaction. Um, you notice that all of these say strategic at the beginning. Um, and so when it, we're doing these, we're not just doing these because we don't want to talk. We're doing these because it's a good strategy for us not to say anything. Um, in this last election cycle in the U.S., um, there were situations where both Trump and Biden 
um, did not say anything or refused to act because they didn't want it to change the way people were voting or they didn't want to change the narrative about what was being said. So they just didn't comment on certain things or they didn't act on certain things and let other people kind of take over those arguments for them. Um, Starbucks here in the US actually had a controversy um, about their holiday cups. Um, each year they do these lovely um, holiday mugs that people will fill up their, their beverages in. Um, and the mug that they chose to do that last time had mittened hands that looked like they were holding hands. And because it was mittens, um, people who were anti-LGBTQ plus said, oh, only girls wear mittens. So those are two girls holding hands. So Starbucks is obviously trying to do something to cater to the LD LGBTQ plus community. And so very right wing conservative groups in the U.S. started coming after Starbucks and saying, you know, why are you promoting this? Um, how dare you? Christmas is a Christian holiday. Um, and so there's all this social media buzz about the hands holding on the cups. And Starbucks just sat back and let their public kind of argue about it and didn't really address it. Um, and if we, you know, you ask Starbucks afterward, ask their CEO why they didn't comment. And their, their whole argument was, well, it was ridiculous. It was a design on a holiday mug. It was in no way trying to, trying to make a political statement. And so there was no reason for us to comment on people who were saying that this was two women in an, you know, a, an embrace on our mugs. It just wasn't, it, it wasn't something that was, you know, big enough for us to want to comment on it. And we figured our holiday mugs are only around for a short period of time. It'll blow over. And so they just didn't say anything about it. All right, our last category here, and this is the one that actually backfires the most for organizations, and this is the non-apology. This is where we see organizations and people not take responsibility for our actions. Um, in the U.S., we have um, these TV shows where it's uh, housewives. And so there's the Housewives of Dallas, there's the Housewives of New York, there's the Housewives of Atlanta, um, and then a couple in California. Um, and these housewife shows are famous for the non-apology. So instead of saying, I'm sorry, I hurt you, the people on these shows, the women on these shows will say, well, I'm sorry you were offended. And so they're not really taking responsibility for their actions. And so it kind of sounds, the first words are, I'm sorry. So it kind of sounds like they're going to apologize, but then they're, they're putting it on the victim and saying that you were offended. I'm not apologizing for our organization's actions. I'm not apologizing for what I did. I'm sorry you got offended by it. And so non-apologies often backfire horribly on the organization or on the person who's making the non-apology because it's not sincere. It's not credible. It's very insensitive. And so it really looks like there's, you really don't care about your publics if you use this type of response. All right, in that victim cluster that Coombs, that Coombs defined in situational crisis communication therapy, uh, theory are nonviolent opposition and violent opposition. So this is where your organization holds kind of the least amount of responsibility because the opposition are the ones who are creating the crisis or kind of attacking your organization. And so in this case, you can go on the offense or you can go on the defense. And so those deny strategies are very effective, effective in this victim cluster. Um, we're going to take a look first at some of those offensive responses. Um, so you can attack the organization that is coming after you. Um, you can try to bring shame on that organization and kind of make them look bad for what it is that they've done. 
Um, you can try to shock them. You can kind of sound the alarm about that organization and, and really call them out about what it is that they've said or that they've done. And you can threaten them. In most cases, this is a threat of legal uh, recourse where you're going to sue them for libel or slander or, you know, or basically kind of attacking your organization for needless reasons. And so all of these uh, kind of operate from the idea that the, your organization is clearly in the right and does not need to do anything. Um, you know, this crisis is not of your doing. And so you don't really have to apologize for anything um, because you, this other organization is the one that has attacked you and you're merely kind of coming to your own uh, offense. You're basically coming at, coming back at them. Um, in the U.S., we had an incident with Planned Parenthood where there were grassroots organizations that were making videos talking about what they did with the aborted babies and saying that these, these aborted fetuses were being used for research, that they were being sold, um, all kinds of very offensive things. And so what actually came out after a huge investigation was that the people who had made these videos um, had strung together various clips, had lied in some instances of videos, and had basically done it because they wanted to make sure that Planned Parenthood lost their funding. And so um, the, it came out in court, actually, that they had staged some of this stuff. And so what Planned Parenthood did was start attacking the organization that had attacked them. Um, and basically calling them out and talking about all of the non-factual things that they had done, all of the fake video components that they had done. Um, and so really kind of going back and, and trying to destroy the reputation of the video company that had done this. And it was very effective. It actually gained a lot of people actually started supporting Planned Parenthood after that, after they could see what the truth was and what what had happened with these videos. And so it was a very, a very positive thing for Planned Parenthood at the end. The next one that we see is our defensive responses. And so you will see, um, again, denial. So they're not going to accept the blame for this. They're going to excuse what that has taken place. So minimize what, what has happened. Um, they're going to justify of their organization, um, and they're going to reverse it. They're going to try to take whatever is being said about them and turn that into a positive. Um, so recently, we've had a lot of organizations in the U.S. start taking off some of their racist caricatures, um, some of the racist names that are on certain things. Uh, we had a hand that was called Lady Antebellum, that they did not realize that antebellum referred to the slavery period during the South. And so they changed their group name to Lady A. Um, we've seen places like Quaker Oats removing the Aunt Jemima stuff, the Uncle Ben's that was on their rice. Um, Land Lakes had an Indian woman on the front of their, their packaging. And so removing some of those um, basically uh, stereotypes of minority groups. And so remove those from their packaging and from their ads. Um, and then we've had organizations that have decided to keep their racist caricatures. Uh, so on the corner of this slide, you'll see there is an organization, uh, it's actually here in Oklahoma where I teach at called Eskimo Joes. And they announced early in, in the summer of 2020 that they were going to get rid of the Eskimo that they use in their advertisements and in their branding. Um, it is a picture of somebody that looks like, um, it's almost like a gorilla face with big teeth. And it looks a lot like the caricatures that were made of black people black, back during slavery. And so it doesn't really look like an Eskimo. And of course people, you know, from, Canada and Alaska have said that's not what Eskimos look like at all. Um, 
And so there are a lot of groups out there that said, this is racist. You need to get rid of it. And at the beginning of the summer, they announced that they were going to, they're like, yes, we, we hear you. We're going to get rid of ours. Just like these other groups have gotten rid of theirs. And we're going to do that. Well, about halfway through the summer, you see this, this uh, social media tweet was on August 3rd. Um, they came out and said, we got a lot of comments from our customers who really like our branding and really like our Eskimo Joe um, and Buffy, which is the, the dog that is in the, the little cartoon. Um, and so we're going to keep it. Uh, so basically what happened was 30,000 people in Oklahoma, uh, which is a very conservative, very uh, red in, in, in uh, US terms, red means Republican state, um, they basically called in or, you know, sent them social media stuff and said, don't get rid of it. We love it. It's part of our, you know, part of our history or part of what we loved as children. And so they're like, oh, our customers like it. Um, and just kind of discounted the people who had approached them about changing it. And so they then came under fire for keeping this. And even now, um, as I walked across campus the other day, I saw three different students wearing Eskimo Joe's clothing on campus. And Eskimo Joe's has reversed its stance and decided they're going to keep this very racist caricature. And their justification for it was that our customers love it. Um, and so this is something that my students and I are actually following. Uh, we're looking to see what some of the comments are and how people are kind of handling this going forward, uh, because there are a lot of groups out there that are not letting this die down and are very strongly going out, going after Eskimojo still. And so this particular crisis for this organization is not over yet. All right, in what Coombs calls our preventable cluster are what we need to use our rebuilding strategies for. So when there are things that we could have foreseen or that our organization should have done something about, which is mismanagement, which is having people within our organization who do something that is ethically or morally uh, challenging, um, where we talk about crime that we could have prevented we need to rebuild. And so this is where we have the most amount of responsibility. We very clearly need to make sure that we're taking care of our publics. And so we can do things like pre preemptive action, vocal commiseration, and rectifying behaviors. So our first is our pre which is also called preemptive action. Um, a few years ago, Marco Rubio, who is a senator here in the U.S., um, he is a Republican, um, very staunch Christian, makes lots of comments on social media, quotes, quotes scripture, uh, talks a lot about biblical stories in what he talks about in front of in front of uh, reporters. Um, Time magazine was doing a piece on him, and the headline that they put on it. It was the Republican savior. They sent a preview copy to Marco Rubio's people and the people there, the public relations people automatically were like, oh my gosh, we can't say this uh, because Marco Rubio will be the first to tell you that Jesus Christ is his savior and he doesn't want to be known as a savior. Um, but Time Magazine was like, well, we're not going to change the heading. So this is going to be what the heading is you're just going to have to deal with it. Marco Rubio is just going to have to deal with it. And so Marco Rubio's PR team said, we need to get out before the time cover drops. And so what they did was they said, we know that this time cover is coming out and we don't agree with the headline. And so his statement was very clearly to the media, I'm not the savior, Jesus Christ is. And so his statement came out before the Time Magazine cover came out. And so they were basically trying to head off uh, this before it turned into a full-blown crisis, before it could damage his reputation. Um, and this is actually the hardest one to do because it's really difficult sometimes for organizations to foresee that an issue is going to become a crisis. And sometimes if, if there is an issue and you think, oh, this could be a crisis, by trying to head it off, you actually can make it into more of a crisis. 
uh, because then they're like, well, you knew this was happening. You knew this was a problem and you did nothing about it. Um, and so this one can be a little tricky in certain situations. The next one that we see is vocal commiseration. Um, and so this includes a lot of kind of our, what we consider apologies. Um, and so apology becomes kind of the biggest one that most of our publics want to see. They want to hear your organization say that it's sorry, because when people are hurt, when people feel like there's, there has been damage done, the biggest thing that they want to hear is an organization taking responsibility and apologizing. Now, this is often the one that in the U.S., our legal counsels us against apologizing because in the U.S., if you apologize, you're in some ways admitting responsibility, which opens you up to lawsuits, which could mean millions of dollars that you're going to be kind of reimbursing people or kind of making things right. And so your legal department is often at odds with the public relations people. Public relations people want to apologize. And the legal department is saying, no, you can't apologize because that opens us up to lawsuits. Um, and so that you have to think about ways that you can offer sympathy, that you can say that you're concerned, that you say that, that you that regret a situation happened without actually saying we're guilty, we did this. Um, open us up to lawsuits. And so saying you're sorry, um, saying that we regret things is often very important to the public um, and gets tricky with your legal department. Um, I particularly love the one from KFC. Uh, this happened in some of their stores in the UK. They ran out of chicken, completely out of chicken. And when you're KFC, which is Kentucky Fried Chicken, that's all you serve is chicken. Um, and so the thing that they did, they, they took out a huge full color one page ad the next day. Um, they re rearranged the letters so that it looked kind of like text speak. Um, and basically their whole thing that they said was, we're sorry, we apologize. There is no excuse for a chicken company not having chicken, we will make sure that this does not happen again. Um, and so they made sure that everybody knew about their apology. Um, the other one that I wanted to point out on this particular slide is Malaysia Airlines. And so some of you may remember a few years ago, MH370, the flight that disappeared, uh, that we still do not know what happened to that particular flight or to the 239 passengers on that flight. Um, they took out uh, full page uh, ads in several different publications talking about their condolences and how saddened they were and basically kind of expressing their concern for the victims' families. Um, and so that was something that was very important for them to do in that particular case. Um, I will talk about MH370 here in a couple of minutes as well. It's something that my colleagues and I have done a little bit of research on. Um, and so while this is an example of something that they did right, uh, there are other examples during their public relations during that crisis situation where they did some things wrong. And so I'll talk a little bit about what they did wrong. Uh, the next uh, strategy that you can use is rectifying behavior. So trying to make sure that you're putting people back in the position that they were before the crisis or doing something to make it so that they're in a better position than they were during before the crisis. Um, so some of the things that you'll see is an organization say that they're going to investigate what happened. Um, they're going to do something to fix the problem. They are going to compensate victims, which is something that Malaysia Airlines actually did for victims' families. One of the things that they did right during their crisis situation. Um, and then they're going to repent. They're basically going to say, there's something wrong with our organization and we're going to fix the culture here. We're going to fix what is broken within our organization. Um, an example of this is again, Starbucks, uh, that we had a situation where um, some Starbucks employees called the cops on two black men who were sitting in the store, uh, told the black men that they wanted them to leave for no reason. 
Um, and the police came and arrested the black men. And so people are saying that is a very racist thing for you to do to, to single out two black men who were sitting in your store who were not doing anything wrong and telling, demanding that they leave and then calling the cops on them. And so Starbucks here in the US actually shut down for a couple of days and did racial training with all of their employees from management on down. And they said, we had this incident in our stores. We apologize for it. So you see, they used an apology and a rectifying behavior. They say, we're investigating. This is what we're doing to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, and so really doing everything that they could to make sure that this particular crisis does not occur in the future. Um, and so what we see and what I wanted to point out as I'm kind of wrapping up these different strategies is often when you're in a crisis situation, you're not just going to use one of these strategies. You're going to use strategies in conjunction with each other. So, for example, with Starbucks, they used an apology, which was what we just talked about on the previous slide. They also talked about they were going to investigate and they had something where they were going to correct and repent and so you'll start to see that organizations layer many of these strategies on top of each other to come up with the most effective response. And so often these, these strategies don't stand on their own, they get used together. And those are that's often the best way to approach a crisis is to figure out of these strategies, which ones are going to work the best together to make sure, again, going back to situational crisis response theory, what is the best way to make sure that we are addressing the harm that has been caused to our publics and making sure that our publics are taken care of? And so a combination of these strategies is often the best way to do that. All right, our next tip during crisis communication. So remember, we're in the crisis. We're trying to manage the crisis. We're trying to contain it. Um, and we call these our Bs, be quick, be accurate, be consistent. Um, so tell your story uh, before someone else can. Make sure everybody knows what's going on. Double check all information so everything that you're putting out is truthful and accurate. Um, and make sure that everybody who is speaking is using the same talking point. So when we say speak with one voice, that doesn't mean that we only have one sp spokesperson. It means that anyone who we have designated as a spokesperson, and this can be multiple people, that anyone who's out there speaking is saying the same things. We're giving them those talking points. They're using those same things, and they're all on the same message that we need to get out to our public. You'll also hear us, as public relations people, you'll often hear us talk about controlling the narrative. And this essentially means we're getting out there and we're putting out our organization's story before someone else can tell our story. So we wanna be the ones who talk about our organization and talk about what it is that we're doing and how sorry we are and how we're taking responsibility. We don't want a, a news cycle or two to get out there and then we, we show up and we have to refute what somebody else has, has said about us. If we're out there first and we're controlling the narrative, then other people have to respond to our story. We're not responding to theirs. And so controlling the narrative is a very important part of crisis communication. Another important part is providing enough information. So we talked about being factual. You also have to make sure that you're giving enough information um, so that you don't end up in a situation where rumors start. Um, and rumors are kind of the, the black hole of a crisis situation. Because once one rumor starts, more and more and more rumors will start. So you have to provide enough information so that things don't happen. For example, Yahoo News came out with this particular piece a couple of years ago. And what the actual thing is, we had two people in Atlanta who had Ebola, two. And the Center for Disease Control was already on it, was already handling it, had already put the hospital that they were at in lockdown, was already containing it. But nobody was talking about how many people 
had Ebola. All we knew was that there was a hospital being locked down and that, and that the CDC was, had been, had been, had basically taken over. Nobody was talking about how many people, nobody was talking about what was, you know, what was put into place to protect the doctors and nurses. No information was coming out. And so various news agencies kind of started running with what they heard. And so it became, oh, we've got 145 people infected. And we started blaming people who had brought the disease in from Africa, which actually wasn't even the case. Um, but this was the big rumor because the CDC, when they instituted the lockdown of the hospital, didn't provide any information. And so you have to provide factual information to head off rumors. You also have to provide context for your information. And so in the case of the MH370 disappearance, um, they, Malaysia Airlines was doing good the first 24 hours. If you look at, um, again, this is part of my research that I came out with a couple of years ago. If you look at the first 24 hours of their crisis response, they were being very diligent in almost every hour, putting out more information about what they knew at that point, which at the time really wasn't a lot. Um, but they were very clearly addressing, they were addressing, the Malaysian government was addressing, they were making sure that they were getting information out to the various agencies that they were working with, um, and the media and the victims' families, and they were putting out information in a very timely manner, up to the point where the victims' families started to get very frustrated with Malaysia Airlines, and they started saying started calling the airlines names and basically disparaging them to the media. And Malaysia Airlines took that personally. They didn't understand that these are victims who are very emotional and just want to know what happened to their family members. Um, and they should have just been strategically silent when they were being called names. They should not have responded to it at all, but they did respond and they started attacking the victim's families and they started denying them information and they started saying, well, we're not gonna speak to you anymore. And so you saw that the information that they were giving completely dropped off after that first 24 hours. Uh, the other thing that they did was they started getting really irritated by requests for information. And so what they decided to do was take the recording from between the airplane and ground control, and they took the entire recording and just dumped it on the media and said, here, take this. You can listen to it, disseminate it out on your TV stations, in your newspaper, whatever. We're giving you the information, now leave us alone. And so those TV stations didn't have any context for this particular recording. They're listening to it. They're trying to make sense of the various communications that went back and forth from air command to the plane. And they're, and they're like, okay, well, here's where they last spoke and here's what was said. But the airlines didn't say everything up until the point of the disappearance was completely normal. Every single one of the communications back and forth from the plane, there was nothing alarming there. There was nothing out of the ordinary. There was nothing that said that there was anything wrong with the plane. There was nothing that said that, you know, this could have been a hijacking situation, nothing. And so the media with this video or this audio dumped on them started saying, oh, well, you know, there obviously something was wrong because they were communicating so much back and forth. Well, it was just the normal communication. And so by not providing the context and not saying what these tapes consisted of, again, rumor and speculation. So all kinds of different things. For the example, BBC News said it was found near the Bermuda Triangle. There were other news outlets to talk about how it had been shot down how it had been hijacked and flown to an island somewhere, how it had been used as part of a military training maneuver, how it had been, they'd been abducted by aliens. Um, so all kinds of rumor and speculation. So there is a very clear balance that you have to do between not enough information and too much information. And so you, again, you have to be factual. You have to provide those five W's and the H. You have to provide any type of statistics that you possibly can. 
and you have to provide context for anything that you put out into the public that a normal viewing public or a normal listening public may not be able to make sense of on their own. You have to provide the background for that so that they don't start to come up with, with stories to fill in the blanks that they see. All right, so our next stage of this is a recovery. So once you have contained this crisis, you want to move into this phase where now you've taken care of the public. So you've made sure that you have that the harm that was caused has been is resolved or whatever it was that you needed to, to take care of. There's a technical glitch, can we hold on? I request the participants to kindly hold on and wait patiently. We have our expert has uh, lost connection. Hoping to resume in another few minutes. Kindly hold on. Dear participants, kindly hold on. There's a technical glitch from her end, and she'll be joining in two minutes. I just spoke to her.
I am so sorry, you guys. I got kicked out of Zoom for some reason. So thank you for bearing with me. I'm so sorry to have interrupted the talk. Um, I'm going to kind of pick up where I left off and talking about recovery. Uh, so this is after we've kind of controlled the, kind, the crisis. We're in that mode where we can focus. Um, we can take the focus off the public because we've handled the crisis. We've kind of worked through the harm. And now we can start to focus on the organization and the reputation of the organization. So let me get us back in. All right, so in our recovery, one of the things that we need to start thinking about is who we are communicating with. And so in that recovery phase, some of that communication shifts from who we were talking to during the crisis to who we can talk to now that we are kind of moving past the crisis. Um, and again, like I said, there were several things that Malaysia Airlines did right, uh, but there were several things that they did wrong. And so one of the biggest things was the text message that they sent out to victims' families. Um, that channel, that particular channel that they used was not the right channel. And so um, in your recovery phase, when you're dealing with reputation, when you're obviously still dealing with people who are harmed by what it is your organization did, um, you need to figure out who those people are and you need to make sure that you're addressing them appropriately. The next thing that we see um, is that you need to listen. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is listen to your team. You often have a lot of people that you're working with who have some kind of expertise or something that they can lend to the crisis. And so you find out what they can offer during the crisis and find out what it is that they need from you and what you can get from listening to them. Um, we're, uh, we're dealing right now with uh, Facebook papers in the US and talking about the crisis that is facing Facebook. Um, and one of the reasons that Facebook is facing this huge crisis right now is because they didn't listen to their employees. There were several employees who were bringing different issues to them along, along the way. And the people in management at Facebook did not listen to what was being brought before them. And so now they're in a huge crisis, whereas if they had listened, if they listened to the people who were telling them about these issues, they could have headed off this crisis. Next thing you need to do is listen to your audience. And there are four main things, and this comes from research from um, Heverin and Zach. They did a lot of research on what takes place on social media during crisis situations. And they found that it doesn't matter if it's if they're using social media, if they're using traditional media, or if they're using interpersonal communication, the four biggest things they're looking for in a crisis is information. So they're looking for information on their own. They wanna know what is happening during the crisis. Um, they want to be able to share information. So when they find things, they want to be able to communicate them out to other people. So they're looking for credible places that they can get information that they can then share. So they, as a PR person, you want to be that credible source that they can share out to other people. They want to be helping with coordinating action and assistance. And we all know that in many crisis situations, especially man-made or natural disasters, there are a lot of different things that come into place where we need to get food to people, we need to get water to people, we need to help find them shelter, we need to help get them clothed. And so anytime that we can be someplace that helps coordinate those actions and get that information out to people, that's really good for your organization to be able to do during recovery. Um, the other thing that we see is that people who are in those audiences really feel that they want to communicate their emotions and opinions. So some of my research looks at what do people do in these crisis situations when they need to grieve or mourn. And so one of the things that public relations people have found is that they are the ones who need to provide spaces for people to do that mourning. Um, so during times of crisis, like we're facing right now with COVID, there are several nonprofit organizations 
who have devel developed social media or web sites where people can go and share stories about people who have died from COVID. Because what we know about crisis is that people flock to it. And that's one of the reasons where when we have command information centers, people kind of converge on the command information center. Uh, we saw this during September 11th, instead of running away from the Twin Towers and kind of fleeing this crisis situation, people converged on the scene and actually were standing around for hours and hours and hours trying to figure out what had happened. And so what we wanna see uh, public relations people do is create spaces where people can go to get information. So we can kind of clear people away from the wreckage area. We can clear people away from some of the communication that, that needs to take place on social media where we're coordinating action or sharing information and provide them with an alternate space that that can take place. So when that emotions and opinions will sometimes overtake all of the other conversation. And so we need to put together a Facebook memorial page where they can go and mourn. And so they're not in the rest of the social media presence at sharing their, you know, their feelings on things. And so one of the jobs of the, of the public relations person is to figure out what are those spaces that we need to put together? Do we need to put together a one page website where people can go to get information about where they can get assistance? Do we need to put together a morning page where people who need to share their emotions can go and do that? Do we need to put together a page where people can just chat and kind of work things out and talk things through? What is it in this crisis situation that we need to do to listen to that audience and make sure that they're getting the information that they need? Uh, the next thing that we need to do is let the audience guide our messages, where we need to first identify the common questions that they're going to ask, but then we need to kind of figure out what are the ways that they're going to ask us things? Um, and so when we're talking about, this is one that I pulled from a South African paper about COVID. People's questions about COVID were very similar. People wanted to know how it was, you know, getting around to others, how it was being spread. They wanted to know what precautions they needed to take. They wanted to know how likely they were to be affected by it, what the symptoms of it were, um, when a vaccine was going to be released to the general public. Uh, and, you know, and we still have the everyday death toll and the everyday number of people who are hospitalized from it. So what is that messaging what are the common questions that people are asking and what are the what's the messages that we need to put out to make sure that we're addressing those questions um, on the organization level one of the things that we need to think about is how do we tell people that they should still associate with us when we're in the middle of a crisis that we are partially to blame for fully to blame for whatever at the other end of this we need to provide them with a reason that they should still be loyal to us or still use our product or, or use our service. And so we have to come up with messaging that's going to tell them why we should still be a viable option for them in the future. The next thing that we talk about in recovery is how do we turn this threat? So a crisis is a threat situation. How do we turn this into an opportunity for our organization and not for our organization to increase sales? Because the first, if the first thing that you do is start talking about, let's get back to business, we want you back as customers, then you've just created another issue for yourself. But to turn this opportunity into something where you can say that your organization has learned or that your organization is going to do better moving forward. So you turn it into an opportunity to emphasize your growth. Um, and so looking at ways that your organization can make changes, can do better and come, come out on the other side and say, you know, do those things, apologize, empathize, show concern, offer, you know, what you're going to do to fix the problems. But what is it that your organization is going to do to grow from this? Uh, so here at the University of Oklahoma, we had several racist incidents that occurred where students were in blackface. 
We had a couple of professors on our campus uh, that use the N word in classes. Um, and so just kind of incident after incident. And so we had protests on our campus. We had uh, various athletes on our campus speaking out about the racism that was taking place. We actually, there's a show um, in the US called Saturday Night, Live, Saturday Night Live, which is a parody show. Our university ended up in one of their sketches talking about the racism on the Oklahoma campus. Um, so there were just a lot of things that were taking place um, that our administration was not dealing with. So the person who was our president at the time, um, he did not want to deal with these racist incidents. He basically said, well, we're just going to talk about it and we'll see how people feel a couple days from now. His take was, well, there'll be another crisis in a couple days and this will go away. Well, it didn't go away and it ended up actually with a sit-in of um, a lot of our students outside of the president's office door for a number of days. They sat there um, and didn't eat, basically uh, just they were doing a, a hunger strike. They were just drinking water, but they sat there for days until they could get him to actually speak to them. And so he, by not acknowledging the issue, by not even speaking to people, it turned into a larger issue on our campus. And so if he had just said, hey, this is what we're going to do about it. These are the things we're going to put in place. This is what's going to happen to the students that did this. Um, if he had actually addressed the crisis and empathized with the people who were who were feeling that this this campus was not safe for them, um, that this that they were going to be mocked, that they you know they could not walk into a place where people were not going to look at them as other. Um, that he did not take into take seriously their feelings on the matter. And so if he had listened to that or to that group of people, if he'd actually tried to empathize and look at what it was that was happening and, and come up with a plan to kind of overcome this, um, it, it turned into a much bigger issue than it should have. If he had just taken the time to empathize, acknowledge, and, and kind of figure out a way for our university to move forward, we could have turned that into an opportunity to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion on our campus, to talk about the ways that we should be treating our students, to talk about, about the ways that students should be treating each other, and to really have those conversations that could have made some really positive change at the, on the OU campus. And so thinking about those, those ways that you can learn, that your organization can grow, and that you can move forward after a crisis situation. Um, our next one is in recovery, we want to figure out what the solution to the problem is. Um, one of the most famous cases that I talk about in my crisis communication class was the Tylenol murders. Um, so back in the 80s, there were several instances where cyanide was put into Tylenol capsules and people died from this poisoning. And so at the time, the media um, started looking at Tylenol and said, what is it you did? Uh, and Tylenol didn't have any answers. Tylenol looked at every single part of their organization and, and from the, the moment that the capsules are created to the moment that they left their facilities and they were trying and trying and trying to figure out how this could have possibly happened and they could not come up with an answer. And so what they did was they asked the news outlets to come into their facility and see exactly how Tylenol was produced. And so the news outlets filmed everything and the news outlets could not see any situation where th this tampering could have happened at the Tylenol plant. And so this was great PR for Tylenol because it, it completely removed them from any responsibility, but it allowed the news stations the opportunity to figure out how this was taking place. And it turns out that there were people who were actually opening up the Tylenol packages and injecting the Tylenol capsules with cyanide and killing people. It had nothing to do with Tylenol. It was actually people who were killing people on purpose. Um, and so 
what the, what Tylenol decided to do was, hey, we weren't at fault. The media showed that we weren't at fault. What we're going to do from here on out is change our packaging. So today, Tylenol has a an aluminum uh, seal on the top of their bottles that you have to actually open, and they have the childproof. Uh, tamper proof caps on all of their packaging. So two layers of protection were added to those bottles to ensure that people could not get into them and poison them again in the future. And so that, you know, what was a problem for Tylenol where originally everybody thought that Tylenol was killing people actually turned into an opportunity for them to show that their organization was going to do these things to make Tylenol safe. And if you look at Tylenol now, that company leads the market here in the U.S. in pain relievers because of the things that they put into place, because of their openness and transparency in bringing the media in and showing exactly what was happening in their plant. Uh, the next thing that you want to do is educate people about your efforts. So it, it's not enough to just change the way that your organization is doing things or to talk in leadership meetings about what is happening, you have to actually promote out to the public what the things are that you're doing differently. Um, so making sure that your audience hears what those changes are. This is very common. This is what we do with our CSR efforts. We talk about the social responsibility things that we're doing. We talk about the good that we're doing in our communities. We also need to talk about the changes that we've made in relation to our crisis. And we have to talk about it in the same way that we do our social responsibility. It has to become part of our branding and part of our platform. And so if we don't say, if we make changes, but we don't tell anybody about it, it's kind of like if a tree falls in the forest, is somebody going to hear it? Um, it's that same thing. If we're not vocal about what we're doing and tell people what we're doing, then they're never going to know that we made those changes. We also need to embrace the opportunity to answer questions. Um, not only to say, hey, we too were hurt by this situation. We hate that we're in this situation. Um, but not just kind of stonewall and not tell people no comment and not say, oh, this is in the past. We're not going to address it any longer, but actually answer questions about what it is that we've done and figure out, are, are we listening? Are there new ways that we could be doing different things or doing things better? Um, and so acknowledging and saying, we're committed to moving forward. We want to find the answers to this and we welcome the opportunity to address your questions. Those are some of the hallmarks of recovery that really help organizations move forward after a crisis. Um, being professional with your messaging is key. Um, so again, we had the incident on the OU campus. We had very heated debates. In some instances, professors on campus took part in those debates. Um, and this particular professor uh, is someone who is very well known on campus. She heads up our international studies department here. Um, a lot of students on this campus love her. And she went into the dialogues that we were having and had very good points that she was making. And everybody was listening to her right up until the point where she started cussing and throwing papers in the face of our university president. So once she stepped over that line of professionalism and started using you know, what we considered derogatory terms and rude cuss words and disrespecting somebody by throwing a paper in their face, even if you don't agree with a person, there is a decorum that you use when you're talking to someone. And she stepped over that boundary. And so all of those good points that she had been making before that kind of fell by the wayside and nobody remembered those good points anymore. All they remembered was those really dis disreputable actions that she used during that, what we are now calling a tirade that she did during, during that open forum. 
And so being professional is very important in those crisis situations. Even when your organization is frustrated, even with like Malaysia Airlines, you feel like the victim's families are attacking you and you don't have any new information for them and you don't know what happened to the plane. So you can't even say what, you know, whether your organization was at fault or not, um, but not, not being disrespectful um, making sure that you are the bigger person as the communicator and you're being very patient, very kind, very empathetic in what you're doing. Um, being consistent with your messaging. Um, so making sure that everybody who is going to be using those talking points that you're putting out, that they believe in those. We, in, we call that buying into the message so that they feel comfortable with it, they believe it, they are going to be consistent with it. One of the things that we see, saw during the BP oil spill was BP was doing great with our messaging. They were very consistent in their messaging up to the point when their CEO made a comment along the lines of, I just want my life back. He said he wanted the, the crisis to be over because he wanted to get back on his jet plane and go back to his mansion and have his life back. Um, and the people in Louisiana who were the most strongly hit by this were extremely irritated by that comment because their livelihood was tied into the Gulf and in many cases into oil production. And they were, they were going to be evicted from their homes because they no longer had jobs. They didn't know when they were going to be, where they were going to get food to put on the table. They didn't know, you know, where their next paycheck was going to come from. And so for this multimillionaire to be talking about how he just wanted his life back, kind of threw off all the rest of the messaging that they had been doing during that. So you have to make sure that whatever is being said is consistent and goes along with the messages that your organization wants to put out. Um, the other thing that we tell you to do to not to do um, is make comparisons to other organizations. So basically say, well, yeah, what we did is bad, but this other organization, they did something worse. Um, we talk about how it just puts you in the mud with the other pigs. Um, so you don't want to play that less bad. We're not as bad as the other organization. You don't want to play that game where you're pointing out how somebody else's crisis was worse than yours um, because it just makes your, it just puts you in that same category as that organization. It just puts you in that same crisis and you're really trying to recover and by pulling yourself into some other organization's crisis, you're slowing your recovery. So that's one of the things we don't want to see. Um, and then sometimes our best option is to let other people defend you, um, especially in the day and age of social media. There are a lot of other people out there who will step up and will will talk about how great your organization is or why they should continue being a client of your organization, or you know, what are some of the great things that your organization has done in the past. Um, so this again took place on the Oklahoma campus during the blackface incidents. And a lot of people, a lot of alumni, a lot of people who had friends or family who had gone to OU, a lot of people who had just visited the campus started talking about, hey, yeah, this blackface thing is awful. But there's all these other great things that OU is doing. We love OU and we think that they're going to come out on the other side of this crisis and they're going to be better for it. Um, and so letting some of the alumni, letting some of the people who love OU talk for us was, was helpful in our recovery. There were a lot of people out there that were willing to talk about the great things that we were doing here to try to combat racism, to try to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so we had to we had to kind of let those voices ring out and help us through that crisis. All right, our final stage, and this is where I will end today, is that your organization should learn from whatever crisis that it was in. You should be able to focus on things and take into account the things that your organization did right, the things that your organization did wrong, the things that you want to correct in the future. Um, one of the things that I've seen time and time again when organizations get into a crisis 
is they forget what the other messaging is that they have going out for their organization. So for example, when the blackface incidents were taking place on the OU campus, um, we had several people who were in minority schools trying to recruit high school students to come to our campus. And so we had to abruptly change the messaging that they were using and talk about, hey, we've got this thing going on, but OU is, is still going to be a great place because we're going to make these changes. And so uh, figure out what the messaging is that's going out. I uh, was on the LSU campus when they had a bomb scare. And so everybody converged on the crisis information center. Everybody was, all of the people who were supposed to be working the crisis were there doing stuff, getting students off campus, making sure people had exit plans, making sure that they were clearing, the police patrol was going through and clearing the buildings and they were telling everybody that, you know, which buildings were safe to go into. Um, one of the things that they forgot to do, however, was notify the company that was running their social media that they were in the middle of a bomb scare. And so there was messaging that was going out during the bomb scare talking about how it's a great day to be a tiger and how lovely it is on the LSU campus. Um, and so nobody had informed the person who had the regularly scheduled social media messages that he might want to stop any of those canned messages from going out while this bomb, bomb scare was taking place. And so that ended up being kind of one of the things that they learned from that experience that they, that they now realize that they had to incorporate social media into their crisis response. And they had to make sure that those messages that were scheduled to go out got turned off during the crisis. Um, and so that's one of the things that your organization might learn. It might learn, uh, we had a crisis situation with an organization in the UK where they were firing their employees and the intern was the one running the social media and the intern was live tweeting the firings and nobody else had the passwords to the social media account so they couldn't get in to stop what the intern was doing. Um, so learning about who has the passwords? When can we get into the social media account? Who's running the social media account? Um, and so that can take place as part of your learning as well. There's all kinds of things that you can learn from your crisis situation that you should then take and implement into your crisis plan. You update your crisis plan after every single crisis so that you make sure that next time you have one, you've got the best most recent and in and information that's going to help your organization protect publics and move through recovery in an in an efficient way. So that is what I have for you guys. I apologize again for technology. I did not mean to disappear on you. Um, I want to open it up for questions. Let me stop sharing here. Get back in. So questions. Participants, you may raise your hands if you wanna ask questions or you can also share your questions in the chat box. See if I can the get my camera to start working here. I, I just realized my camera isn't working. A feedback form will also be circulated shortly during the question and answer session. Participants, kindly raise your hand so that we can allow you to ask questions. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, this is uh, Mo Ganesan from Tamil Nadu Open University, Chennai. Hi. Hi, ma'am. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful session. It's very enlightened to me. Uh, uh, many participants also, they enlightened you. Uh, uh, thanks, heartful thanks. 
um sak uh, i'm not asking cosin but i i appreciate you uh, it's a wonderful uh, session and and first time i'm listening a foreigner uh, lecture thank you ma'am thank you thank you thank you so much thank you for taking part today yes ma'am yes ma'am thank you thank you thank you sir anybody else would like to ask questions regarding today's topic on crisis communication csr I'm gonna, i'm gonna put my email into the chat so if anybody wants to contact me after this you have access to me so even if you don't think you have any questions right now please feel free to reach out i'm happy to talk to you thank you ma'am thank you I've finally joined you guys. It's now officially 1:20 in the morning here in the US. So I'm now on the same day that you all are. Okay, as a uh, you know as a moderator and been listening to your uh, session, uh, I have a doubt. So, um here in India, uh, most of the organizing organizations here uh, do not give much to PR Uh, a pr persona is not available uh, but then leading organizations right now um have accepted the importance of a pr persona and then how do you think um uh, a pr role fits in um, and especially in companies do you think a pr uh, is a must in the industry so would you like to yeah so um one of the things that we talk about as importance for public relations um is the idea that every organization should have what what we would call um effective and ethical communication and so a lot of times the people who are running an organization are very concentrated in the business side of things or in the human resources side of things um they're not trained in communicating for the organization and so sometimes the biggest issues arise when people who are not familiar with communication try to communicate and so that's the biggest reason that every organization should have a pr person simply because they're not trained as communicators and you don't want that to become your organization's issue all right thank you so much i think we have a question in the chat box uh, what are the traits or qualities a student should have before hitting crisis reporting yeah so, so one of the things that i often tell my students um in crisis and and just kind of everyday public relations is to always think about who their messaging could harm because you can come up with a million reasons for why your message is great or why it's creative or why it's funny or why it's going to sell something for the organization um but if you can sit and look at your message and figure out are there some communities or some individuals that this message could harm um that will often help you make the necessary changes to your messaging and so you know my biggest thing and i teach a lot of uh diversity equity and inclusivity stuff in my classes my biggest thing that i always caution students is think about what your what that program is that you're developing if that if there's something that could um and not not just physically harm but emotionally harm somebody don't ever put out messages where you're excluding somebody where you're making fun of a culture where you're making fun of a race where you're minimizing anything that that culture or that race has gone through um anything where you're appropriating their culture for basically capitalism purposes um you want to make sure that you're not doing anything that can be construed as 
taking advantage of that group of people. And so that's one of the things that I, I think in any situation, whether it's a PR situation or a crisis situation, think about who you could be harming and then focus all of your messaging around not harming that group. Thank you so much. Um, anybody else who has a question can raise their hand. Or shall we call it a day? Well, it has been an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, ma'am, for taking your time off today. Um, it's been a pleasure having you today. Um, we've learned a lot uh, on crisis communication and uh, I think uh, uh, I'm a person who loves PR. Uh, PR is my forte. And uh, we've been conducting a lot of uh, campaigns. Uh, every year we do a campaign uh, at the college where I work and it's, it's scaled heights. And uh, this year it's on domestic violence uh, because uh, we've seen that India has uh, is right now uh, number three after the lockdown uh, because women are indoors and it's been pretty high. Uh, so we're doing a campaign on domestic violence and, you know, women should choose conversation. They should speak up because it's been normalized uh, uh, here. And so uh, for me as a, uh, you know, uh, a person who loves PR, uh, uh, it was great. Your session was great. Uh, we've okay. learned a lot from your session. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, just to put uh, your uh, uh, session in a nutshell, um, uh, I, uh, we've learned about deduction, prevention and preparation, that is brand building, CSR roles, how you can manage crisis, um, uh, uh, have to speak the right thing at the right time, do not give false alarms, have a crisis plan, prepare your fact sheets, uh, manage your crisis when there is a violent Nonviolent situations be, uh, you know, be it natural or man-made, uh, we have to manage the situation in the right manner. Uh, situational crisis by Coombs, um, the model was, I think, was fantastic. It was fantabulous uh, to hear every um, arena of what his model had to say, uh, be it accidental cluster or victim cluster, preventable cluster, uh, non-apology uh, manner. Uh, uh, and then we have to identify whom our stakeholders are. We have to identify whom we are communicating with. Uh, we'll have to listen to our team uh, in order to tackle our threats. Um, and most importantly, we have to analyze that every problem has a solution. Uh, educate and promote uh, what we are doing, especially in our company. Uh, that is, I think, uh, very important uh, as a CSR. Uh, in our CSR effort, embrace opportunities to answer questions because uh, we should treat every, uh, you know, opportunity, treat every opportunity um, as one of the most important thing and we have to be answerable, uh, be professional in communication, uh, be consistent in our message uh, and let others talk uh, for you because sometimes that really works out well. Uh, so thank you uh, once again, Dr. Jensen Mo, for your valuable time in spite of uh, uh, the whole lot of time difference uh, from the other part of the world. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the pleasure was all ours to have you today. Oh, thank you so much. The pleasure was mine. It was great to speak to you and I hope to hear from some of you. Okay. Um, a uh, wonderful rest of your conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, 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 participants, we have our feedback uh, link posted in the chat box. Kindly do fill up uh, the feedback link um, uh, before you log off. Um, handing over the session to the uh, organizers of this conference, Parasi Raja College. Thank you, ma'am. That was a wonderful session. And I hope that was useful to the students as well as uh, for the faculty to develop and develop their 
knowledge regarding the communication. So the proper way of communication. And now the session, we wind up the session. Thank you.